this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touched air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. And if you want more shows every week on Thursdays, we release a bonus show to members only on the website. So if you're interested in hearing extra shows every week, go ahead to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com podcast.com hit the join button and become a member today now if you want some preparedness food go to prepare with the we offer great deals there so in these days a lot of people are looking to stock their pantries and make sure they're ready to go in case the supply chain falls out i say it every week but i really do mean it we're living in uncertain times and if you want to make sure that you and your family are prepared for anything go to prepare with the and get your emergency preparedness food today now this week we have great shows coming up. We have two interviews, one with Carl and one with Emma. Carl's going to share with us this Victorian era lady that he came across and also the times that he was at his grandma's house and what he believed he was visited by an alien type entity. Then we're going to talk to Emma about her shadow men experiences that she's had for six years in the corner of her bedroom. And we're also going to talk about some Enoch talk. It's gonna be a great show today. Two interviews on this week's show. So let's get to it right now. All right, today we got Carl on the show. Carl, how you doing, man? All right, man. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. It was good talking to you here uh, before we started hitting record. And uh, you're in upstate New York, and you, I, I, were you always in upstate New York? Uh, no, I'm actually a native New Yorker. I was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn and Queens. Brooklyn and Queens, man. That's that's a, a crowded area. So <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, well, the city's definitely changed a bit since yeah. uh, back in the day gotten even more crowded i suppose i suppose yeah i i try i just told you before we hit record i try not to make my way up there too much because <laughs> i don't like driving in the city and i just don't like the crowds um but your first experience is i believe when you were a kid right and you saw a victorian era lady it was a ghost in an apartment in new york city right correct actually i was about 30 at the time okay this was like uh, the late 90s i think yeah well, I guess I should give you a little backstory, sort of walk us into this. Um, I had been living in California for about five years, and I moved back to New York, and I needed to find another apartment. So I was sleeping on an air mattress on the, my mother's floor, and I went, those days you could still kind of walk from building to building and maybe talk to a super or a landlord to find an apartment, and I lucked out, and I spoke to this landlord, and... Um, 
he had a fifth floor apartment and a walk up that was like 600 bucks a month. So, you know, 600 bucks a month in Manhattan, I, I, my mind was blown. So I checked it out and I could tell automatically just going into the building that it, it was old. Cause like, you know, the staircases kind of had these grooves in them from when people would walk up the stairs for over a hundred years. And there were still like gas lamp fixtures on the walls, that type of thing. And, um, you know, I mean, I've always believed in the paranormal and ghosts and things like that. But to me, I always, you know, I guess it was from watching the movies. I always assumed they just happened in, you know, big houses somewhere in the suburbs or out in the sticks. But um, actually, I guess I was wrong. Well, anyway, so I, I moved into this apartment and it was like a, a tiny studio. And I noticed like within the first year or so, I'd catch things out of the corner of my eye moving. And when I turned to look, there would be nothing there. So it was already kind of freaky, but you know, I was like, whatever. Um, so time wore on. I like, I'd go to sleep and I notice like the dishes would rattle in the kitchen but I wasn't sure if that was just vibration from the building or maybe it was mice or whatever. Cause I was right on first Avenue and trucks would be rolling down and you'd feel the whole building shake. So anyway, time wore on. And, uh, then one night went to sleep. I woke up and when I woke up, I saw this figure standing at the foot of my bed, looking at me. Um, now it, it, it was like, it wasn't a, well, it was a full body apparition, but it wasn't like, you know, some people say it's just like looking at another person, but that's, it wasn't what it looked like to me. It looked almost like your classic Hollywood ghost, you know, made out of smoke. But, um, she was standing there and she was like Victorian. She had the full on garb, you know, the dress went from her neck all the way down to her ankles. Um, I couldn't really make out facial features or anything like that, but really what flipped me out. I mean, you know, you wake up and it's, you know, when you're looking at something like that, your brain kind of, you know, like when they say your life flashes before your eyes, when you're about to die type of thing, or when you're having an accident or something. Yeah. It was kind of like in those first three seconds, you know, I'm looking at this thing and I'm saying, you know, you're trying to decide, is this real what I'm looking at? Am I asleep? Or, you know, because I could still hear like traffic outside and there's still tons of ambient light coming through the shade. And, you know, <laughs> my first reaction, you know, it was, it's like fight or flight, you know? And um, when I finally realized that what I was looking at was real and it wasn't a dream. It wasn't disappearing. I kind of did both the fight and the flight. Um, I basically kicked, I kicked it from under my blankets, which is dumb in retrospect. I mean, what would that do? You kick a ghost, right? <laughs> but at, at the same time, I like moved back and I slammed my head against the wall. So now I'm seeing stars. My head is killing me and this thing is still not disappearing. So I know that what I'm seeing is real. Um, in, in that moment, that's when she kind of, she backed up towards the other side of the room. And, and the way she backed up, it was like, have you ever been in a, seen a strobe light, been in a nightclub when a strobe light's going and you know how people move when they're in a strobe light? Right. It's, that's kind of what it looked like. It was like she was blinking on and off, materializing and dematerializing in milliseconds. Wow. As she moved back towards the wall. And then what she did was really fascinating because across the room from my bed is an old fireplace, which has long since been sealed off. But when she backed up towards the fireplace, she turned. And she bent over at the waist as if she was lighting the fire or stoking it or 
I don't know, doing something with a teapot, who the hell knows? But that really kind of flipped me out. It was like she was she was doing something that she had done before. The vibe that I got from her looking at me was almost like she was she could have been looking at her child in the past, or she could have been looking at her husband sleeping, and then she goes over to the fireplace. It was like a something she had done a million times before. And um, after she had bent over and did that, she basically, she just vanished. And uh, I was just sitting there with my head pounding, trying to figure out what I just saw, what just happened. And um, I basically spent the rest of the night with the lights on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Me too. Sitting there. <laughs> I would have done the same thing. To, and uh, that was really, after that, nothing else happened. And I, I moved maybe a few years later. But I mean, it's funny, when I walk past the building now, I still go into the city now and then. I look up at that window, you know, and I'm wondering if the person who's living there now is has seen her or yeah. had the same experience. Yeah, I mean, you never know, right? I mean, if you had that experience there, somebody else could have easily had an experience like that as well, either before you or after you. Uh, and the fact that she started flickering on and off like that, that was, to me, that sounds like whatever you were seeing was, had some kind of maybe energy source in order to show itself to you like that. And it's, it was almost like that energy source was being interrupted. Uh, what do you, huh. what do you, yeah. what do you think about like the idea of, you know, these things that you see sometimes being, uh, residual energy versus, uh, actual, an actual apparition intelligently knowing you're there and knowing what it's doing in your presence. Right. Like the residual haunt as opposed to, uh, yeah, I know what yeah. you're talking about. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I think just from her actions, it, it seemed to me like a residual type of thing. But there was definitely, there was mind behind it. You know what I mean? There was, um, how do I describe it? Even though it was a repeated behavior, it was like she knew what she was doing. At least that's the kind of vibe I got. You have you feel like it was you know residual, um, but there was some kind of intelligence there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I got you. Yeah, I mean that's the great thing about. Oh, I don't know if you look at it as a great thing or not, but that's the interesting thing about all this stuff is that we really don't know what is what. We all have our theories, and you have you have the ghost hunters that are on TV and they have their thoughts and opinions on things. And I think everybody has bits and pieces of truth, but I really don't think that everybody has the whole truth. Like uh, as much as these professionals, you know, want to portray that I know what I'm doing. You can trust uh -huh. me. It's like, but do you? Because you've never died before and you right. <laughs> and right. so, like you don't know what's going on on the other side of life and uh we're all really just pretty much guessing and we have certain understandings that you know there's there is some kind of electrical energy that is taken uh is taking place in some of these investigations people do and stuff like that but uh i just don't know if we all truly understand what's going on around us but it's very fascinating um and that, that story that you just shared with us, I find very interesting just because of her flickering in and out. It reminded me a little bit of a story from, oh, shoot, I think it was like episode 17 or 18. I had a guy on and he saw this apparition in his, I think it was his room when he was a kid of um, a cartoon, actually. And I've, I've heard this before. A lot of people, not a lot of people, I should say, but some people see like a cartoon that they're familiar with, like uh, Flintstones or the Jetsons or something. and Really? Like a, a giant Fred Flintstone yes, type of thing? Or? Yes. And That's trippy. It's very trippy. Uh, and I think he saw Fred Flintstone in his room. And if I remember correctly, it was flickering on and off in front of him real fast. Uh, it's something like that. I'd have to go back and listen to that episode. It was... Um, Touching a Bigfoot. I think that is the episode that was on Jason. Um, but it, very it's similar kind of environment. And that's the, the the fun thing I think about this stuff is that, you know, we can take pieces of everybody's story and we, all of a sudden we start comparing notes and it's like, huh, this is very similar to this story. Not the same environment, right. but very similar. And, uh, it, you know, I think that's one of the best ways we can do what we can do to um, 
you know, try to figure out some of this stuff at least. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting that he, it was flickering on and off. I've never heard that before. It was new to me. I thought, you know, if you see a ghost, it would be like almost seeing another person. Right. I, I just think that there's a lot of different variations to people's experiences. And uh, I think sometimes the experience is determined on the person that is experiencing it, uh, how they view their experiences, what they go into an experience already thinking they know, um, and also the environment of the experience to what happens uh, in the moment. You know, uh, there's a lot of different things that, that go on. And uh, it, it's just really interesting to hear people's stories. Um you had uh, an experience at your grandparents' house, and this is when you were a kid, right? Yeah. Why don't you go into that? Because I find it interesting. Okay, yeah. Um, I was about uh, maybe six years old, and uh, my parents had gone to Europe on vacation, so they left me with my grandparents, who had a summer house in upstate New York in a little town called Pine Plains. And... Um, you know, I absolutely, I love my grandparents. I love going up there. It was like, you know, beautiful lake, you know, really ideal kind of thing. And um, in one of the houses, they had a little bedroom for, for me, my parents, you know, company type of thing. And it was right next door to their bedroom. And uh, one night I'm in there asleep and um, I can, you know, both my grandparents, God love them. They both snored like chainsaws. So it was like, it was hard enough trying to get to sleep. But um, I woke up, you know, and God knows what time it was. I don't know, two in the morning, something like that. But um, when I woke up, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> it's sort of similar to the, the previous story. I noticed that the door was ajar. It was open maybe about a foot, which it shouldn't have been because when I went to sleep, it was closed. My grandparents, they tucked me in. They'd always close the door. They closed their door. And that was that. So I noticed the door was ajar. And then I noticed there was a figure, a, a shadowy figure. I could see through the, you know, the crack in the door. It was, I don't know, maybe five feet tall. It wasn't that much taller than me. And, um, the really, if that's not odd enough, <clears throat> what was odder is it, it seemed like it, there was something in its hand and it, it looked, it, it had a cherry like on a, on a cigar. It glowed orange and it lifted its arm towards its face with this orange thing. And, you know, if I didn't know any better, I would think someone was, you know, puffing on a cigar, but there was no smoke. And again, I know I wasn't dreaming because I could hear my grandparents snoring. And so the thing lifted it towards its face. And, you know, of course, six years old, I, I flipped the hell out. So I did what almost any normal six-year-old would do. I pulled the covers over my head. And um, I, I just, you know, I stayed like that. I didn't look again. And um, I must have fallen back asleep. But when I got up in the morning the door was closed and everything was as it was. That's really interesting. Now, what do you think this was? I mean, before I insert any opinion on it, I mean, you're an adult now looking back at this. What do you think was going on there? Well, you know, it, exactly. As an adult and in retrospect, you know, I, I think the, I mean, historically where the house was built, there was nothing there before. It was bare land. It was a forest. So I can't really say that it was a haunting because there was nothing there. And later on, I started reading. Are you familiar with Whitley Schreiber or Schreiber? I forget how you pronounce his name. He wrote the book Communion. It's uh, alien abduction stuff. And that's what I tend to think it was. I, I think it was an alien. Yeah, that's what it sounded like to me when you were describing it. Uh, I've heard so many different experiences with such things like this in people's rooms at night and people have very different experiences encountering a paranormal situation that leans towards some kind of extraterrestrial visitor and what you described it sounded like to me like the, the what i was picturing in my head and we could be wrong 
But what I was picturing in my head was some kind of, you know, small ET creature. And it, I don't know what was in the hand, but I just, I picture ET smoking a cigar now that you said it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just like, what's up? Right. Well, I would have liked it if you put me in a basket and took me for a ride in the sky, but that didn't happen. But, um, yeah, no, I know what you mean, you know, I mean, and I know, you know, just from reading or watching TV, different abduction stories, sometimes there are cases where these things have almost like a wand. And, um, I'm thinking, you know, that apparently maybe they use to, to paralyze people to abduct them. I, I, I'm not sure, but you know, when I started learning about abductions, I, I kind of said, wow, you know, the glowing wand kind of thing. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I just, I just hope I wasn't abducted. If I, if I was, I'm glad I don't remember it. That's interesting that you just said that because a lot of times people tend to want to remember, uh, there's people that don't want to do it, remember, but there's a lot of times people want to remember what they experience when they start getting memories back. Now, what it sounds like is you probably don't have any memories of an abduction, but if you were to start getting memories coming back, do you think that you would want to pursue those memories and dig more, maybe have regression therapy? Or do you think that you'd kind of hold it off as, as long as possible? You know, at this stage of my life, I, I think I would. I would want to know. I would, I would definitely dig deeper. But I, I just, I don't have any kind of inkling that anything like that ever happened. I just know what I saw, but I don't. And, you know, I, they say, you know, once they, if they do abduct you, that it, it never really stops. At least in yeah. some cases, you know, so that would kind of flip me out, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah. live alone in the sticks now as it is, you know, so. And that's the thing. I mean, it, that's all subjective because how do you know it never stops unless you remember it, you know? Uh, exactly. So, I mean, there's people out there that maybe remember an abduction, but they don't remember anything after that. And to say that they 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 continue to have abductions, that's that's very based off of opinion because we don't know. The the only way you know if you were abducted is if you remember the experience. And to say that you know you were abducted one time, therefore you've been abducted several times, unless you remember something, you have a real reason to think that uh, it's really subjective. I don't. I personally Absolutely. don't think that people uh, that everybody that's abducted goes through their entire lives than being abducted all the time. Uh, I think that there's definitely reoccurring abductions, but I don't think that's the rule. I think that's, you know, just a situation. And I think that some people might have been, what if you get abducted and the aliens are like, uh, this is a bad one. We put him back. We don't let <laughs> throw him back. He, he, he's sour. We don't like it. He smells bad, you know, bad hygiene, you know, how are we supposed to mate and, and reproduce with this? This is disgusting. All right, all right. <laughs> You know, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's very interesting, man. And I, you know, I, I'm not here saying that you were abducted. I, I, I just, I don't know. Uh, you don't know. You don't remember. So there's no reason to say that you were abducted. Uh, there's a lot of people that have, you know, UFO experience. I've heard of people having ET experiences where they saw ET, but they adamantly believe that they they were not abducted. Uh, it was just an experience that they saw something crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Right. That's what I mean. Like I've, we've said it several times on the show and stuff, but I mean, there's so many vari variables to people's experiences uh, it, to, to come into any one conversation with somebody with a preset diagnosed set of rules to go into a conversation with somebody would be foolish on my part because there's just so many uh, different variables to people's experiences that, you know, relate to how that experience gets portrayed to the world. Um, so uh, I... I kind of feel like I'm kind of going off on tangent here, so <laughs> let me backtrack a little no, bit. No, no, I, no, I totally agree. And you know what? Once again, in retrospect, during the early '70s, which is when this happened, there was a ton. Uh, they've been documented of um, UFOs sighted in the Hudson Valley. I forget what the what it was called, like the Hudson Valley sightings or something like that. But uh, when I learned that, you know, years later, I kind of said, wow, you know, I mean, because Pine Plains is in the Hudson Valley where I was staying. So kind of gave credence to that. I said, well, who knows? Maybe it really was real. But I know what I saw. So. I think that New York, I think that there's a lot of places in this country that are underrated for activity when it comes to UFOs, 
uh, whatever you're talking about, Bigfoot, things like that. I think New York is one of those states that gets overlooked a lot because people who are not from New York tend, when they hear New York, think the city. And that's the end of the conversation. But the the reality is, yeah, the majority of the population of the state of New York does come from the New, New York City, but the state is so huge and there's so much vast wilderness in that state. There's a lot of crazy, creepy things that happen there that just get overlooked and not talked about a whole lot. A hundred percent. I mean, I live in the middle of the Catskill Mountains. I mean, I'm surrounded by, you know, literally hundreds of acres of just forests and mountains. And uh, actually, I know there was actually a, a Sasquatch sighting uh, in Pine Plains not too long ago. So, really? yeah, you know, and that's only two hours outside of Manhattan, two hour drive. Do you know the details on that sighting? Um, not, I know it was on a place called Stissing Lake, and it was a woman who had experienced it. She, was, um, she lived there and she went camping by herself as a young girl, you know, a teenager. And, uh, yeah, something, I, I don't remember specifically the details, but she had a definite experience that she was tearing ass home, left the tent up there and everything. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot of different sightings in New York with, when it comes to Bigfoot. I mean, I've heard about them really all over the state, uh, especially because I'm in Pennsylvania. I hear a lot of different stories coming from Pennsylvanians that, you know, crossed over the border just on the other side of the border kind of thing. Uh, right. you know, like Buffalo area, um, uh, Bing, Binghamton, how do you say it? Binghamton? Binghamton. Binghamton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, the, I know those are cities, but in those general areas, I've heard lots of different sightings. And so, you know, when it comes to Bigfoot, I mean, it's one of those things where that state, I'm convinced, has strong current activity uh, that just doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And to me, it's a shame. Maybe I should try to find more stories out of there. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I've heard yeah, the Adirondack Mountains. I mean, that's oh, yeah. a huge area. It's, there's got to be something. You know, there's got to be Bigfoot uh, yeah. in New York State. I can't believe that there aren't. When I first started looking into the Bigfoot phenomena uh, online, when I when I ventured online like Facebook and I had came into the Facebook groups of Bigfoot and with this very naive uh, ideology of everybody's here to learn and we want to work together to figure out what this mystery is. That's just not the uh, case. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, you got an me. education real quick, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, how cute is he? <laughs> 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 Poor little guy. Uh, but um one of the first people I came across that I actually had a chance to talk to online about their personal experience was a guy named, I think his last name is Gibson, Dave Gibson. Uh, and uh-huh. he had um, a property in the Adirondacks that they were clearing out and stuff. He was cutting down some trees. Uh, and one of these things threw a log at his head, hit him in the head. Um, he broke Whoa. He broke his neck. And uh, he crawled back to his cabin where his wife was not there. And I think he said he sat on, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this, but I think he sat on his porch uh, drinking beer with a broken neck till his wife came <laughs> to get him. Now and, that's hardcore, man. That, <laughs> that man deserves a medal. I know, I know. And uh, then she you know, took him to the hospital and things like that. But that happened in the Adirondack. And uh, that kind of launched a whole... Uh, different part of his life, you know, like looking into the fun. And that's what I find very interesting too, is that, you know, I look into the topic because I'm interested in it. But people right. out there have experiences before they're interested. And because they had the experience, it launches them into a whole new part of their life where that's all they do in their spare time is they, they it's like they're obsessed with trying to understand what they experience. And I find it interesting because some people, they don't want to go down that road. They're just like, I don't care. I don't care to understand it. Let's just move on. It's something. Uh, right, right. But there's a right, lot of people right. that just become obsessed with it. And it's just, I find it very fascinating. Like, what does it do to your psyche when you experience something like that? I wouldn't know. I've never experienced it. Right. It becomes their white whale, their Moby Dick, right? Big but, time. Yeah. That's I, a great way of explaining it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I could totally see that. I think if I saw a Sasquatch or a, a dog man or something like that, it, you know, I guess you have to have the right kind of personality where it, it's the kind of thing where um, you just you have to know. Some people want to forget, but some people they're just they have to know. I don't know. Maybe if it happened to me, I don't know. You know, I mean, after my my ghost experience, I mean, uh, it was fascinating, scary, but it didn't 
particularly make me want to become a paranormal investigator or anything like that. So, I don't yeah. know. And, and that's it, it's interesting because like I think people go through phases too. Like I've seen people come in and out of the Bigfoot thing where they had experience, they researched it hard for five years, and then they just like I've had enough of this, I'm out. Uh, and even for me, I mean, like uh, when I first started looking into Bigfoot, and I and I made this like conscious decision that I do believe in Bigfoot because of all the people's experiences. Right. Um, I was fascinated by it. There's like this 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 uh, childlike fascination with it that I just I couldn't get enough. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and over sure. time, for me, it becomes a reality. It's like, yes, these are real. I've talked to hundreds of people personally that have had these experiences, and so the the mystery, the 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 childlike wonder, ha- it, it has worn off. And I, I now pursue the topic. Uh, in a different way because I'm not uh, when, when you tell me you've had a, a Bigfoot sighting I don't get this child like wow tell me all about it kind of attitude because I'm not surprised by that now it's like right. okay tell me your experience I'd like to hear about it because uh, you know your experience might have something to contribute to the overall picture of these things and I, I approach it in a very different way now because the fascination the childlike fascination is no longer uh, as strong as it was when I first started looking into it does that make sense oh it makes a hundred percent sense yeah I mean uh, you, you more intellectualized it at this point exactly you exactly know? It's like, uh, like you say, with that childlike wonder, it's more like, uh, you know, when your heart's into it, you know, or like when you meet, meet somebody and you fall in love for the first time, it's that kind of giddy feeling. But then after a while, it becomes something you've learned about and you just intellectualize it. And yeah, it's like, it's somebody, it's like somebody who, you know, grew up loving the ocean. Uh, they're going through high school. They're telling everybody, I'm going to become a marine biologist. They go to college, they get their biology degrees, they, they become a doctorate. And it, 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 in that process, uh, the fascination of the, 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 the ocean and things like that, it, it went from being this amazing place that they just want to expo- explore to, I went through college, I, have, I am now a professional marine biologist. And this is my job now. It's no, and, and, you, and right. you're interested in it, and you enjoy doing what you do, and you wouldn't want to do anything else. But it's no longer this childlike wonder that you had as a kid, and now it's like this is my job, and it's now more intellectual than it was when I was a child. That's kind of sad in a way, though, isn't it? Uh, it, it can be in the sense that um, it, you don't get the 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 um, the flutters in your stomach, right? But right. in the other, on the other sense, it's more invigorating to know that you're past that and you're now looking for the overall picture as to, like in my case, how does this person's experience relate to the overall picture of these people's, everybody's experiences, you know, like everybody has their own story and that story has little pieces that might be able to, um, relate to what's going on here. And I think for, right. for for me, it's now become a puzzle. You know, before it was just a mystery, mysterious thing, and now it's a puzzle. And every person's right. story is Right, now you're looking for piece. like commonalities. And- right, exactly. And I, and I get, I, and I, I don't know if this is a bad terminology, but I'll say it anyways, I get off on that. Like I really enjoy the idea that every time I sit down with somebody, uh, their story is just a piece of a puzzle that I'm personally trying to fit together. And so I don't look for this idea of maybe this person will have the answers to Bigfoot and now it's this person might have a piece of the puzzle that helps me understand this phenomenon more. And that gets me excited. Gotcha. Oh, it's interesting. It's kind of ironic though. It seems like the people who do see Sasquatch are the people who aren't looking for them. Like the more you look yeah. for them, the less chances are that you're going to see one. Oh yeah, I know. I, it's like, I, I always tell people, if you're going out bigfooting with me, it's guaranteeing that you're not going to have an experience because I don't ever see anything. <laughs> you know? Right. So, uh, but anyways, uh, let's get to your your uh, your last situation here that you you had, and uh, this is like there was what two balls of light flying around your house or something like that. Yeah, it was it was crazy. This is where I where I live now. This happened about four or five years ago. Um, it was like this time of year. I was just chilling in my bedroom, reading a book, and um, to get out of my bedroom, it's like these two sliding glass doors, you know takes you right out to the backyard. And so I'm just sitting there. And once again, I 
peripheral vision. I see something that grabs my attention from my peripheral vision. I look out the sliding glass doors, and I see this white ball of light about the size of a golf ball just fly by. And then another one right after it. It's like, have you ever uh, seen Roman candles, Fourth of July, those things they shoot these colored balls yeah. out? Yeah, it looked exactly like that. So I got out of bed, opened the screen door, I mean, uh, the glass sliding door, and I looked and there was nothing. There was no like impact sites, there was nothing. Uh, which is bizarre. I mean, it's bizarre enough because I live on top of a hill. So for so those things, to sh- if someone was going to shoot a Roman candle, they'd have to be up in a tree to do it. And I would, they would, there would be an impact site because right behind my cabin is um, like the base of a mountain, essentially. So uh, they, they would have had to have been an impact site, but there was none. Uh, it was just very weird. I don't know what else to say about it. It was that was about it. It was just physically impossible. Physics wise, it was impossible, but it happened. Yeah, I mean, do you think that this was a natural thing, or do you think this was, uh, you know, maybe more along the lines of ET? <laughs> I don't know. I honest, I honestly don't know if it was a natural phenomenon. If it was like ball lightning or something like that, which it was like a clear blue sky day. <sighs> I don't know. I mean, maybe it could have been technology, too. I mean, technology that we've been working on. It's quite possible. And I do get a fair amount of C-130s flying over my place. They seem to go up to a base in uh, upstate New York, right next to the Adirondack Sport Drum. So uh, they tend to fly over the top of the buildings in my area a lot. I mean, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was weird. Yeah, it sounds weird, man. I mean, I've never seen anything like that, and I think it would be weird if I did see something like that. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things, though, man, like you, you, you go through life and you see things. And I mean, those are three incidents that you actually have experienced throughout your life. And, you know, the chances of you having another experience, probably pretty great. I mean, be- between now and the time you take your last breath, I mean, there's a good chance that you have another experience along the way that uh, is kind of unexplainable, you know? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, uh, why does it happen to certain individuals and not other individuals? You know, that's something I've always thought about, too. That's a great question because there's people who go through their whole lives without ever having an experience whatsoever, nothing. And uh, they think people are just crazy who have experiences. And then there's people right. who have I mean, one experience and they it like launches them into having many. Yeah. I mean, your podcast is a prime example. I, I've listened to your show. Some people have a, what, like three, four, five things happen and they're still young, you know? Yeah, I know. I, I just wish that I... I would have had a Bigfoot experience before I had my son. Cause now, now that I have my son, I, uh, I could live without the Bigfoot experience because yeah. <laughs> these things, <laughs> I don't want to die. Like I used to be like Bigfoot hunter suicidal, you know, like I was like, I didn't care. Like if I didn't go home at the end of the day, but I got to die right. in the hands of a Bigfoot, I'm fine with that because chances are my wife would have married somebody again that's better than me and she would have been better off. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but now I got the kid and I don't want anybody else raising him. So I'm, I'm more protective of my own life. Right. Kind of funny. But don't they, I mean, uh, don't Sasquatch, they don't really hurt people, right? Well, I mean, we got Dave in New York City or New, New York that we mentioned earlier. He threw a log at his head, broke his neck. Oh, that's true. You that's know? true. It all depends. I mean, uh, these creatures are, are finicky. People have experienced, you know, very violent behavior from them. And some people have had more peaceful experiences. I have another friend named Dave who saw one of these things full body. They looked at each other and uh, the thing just kind of backed up into the woods and left. Uh, and so it all, I think it all depends on where you're at. What kind of territory of theirs are you, are you right. in? Uh, what kind of mood are they in? Are you standing between them and their their child? Um you know, are these things uh, dependent on, you know, what's in their DNA? I think that I, my, I have my own thoughts and opinions as to what these things are. And I think that 
maybe the the it's a simple explana- explanation of you know what traits were passed down to them in their DNA as to what they can do and what they how they act around other people, mm. uh, human beings. Um, you know, just like uh, I use the example of uh, I have siblings who um, I have a sister and a brother who are twins, and I'm Puerto Rican. I get pretty dark during the summertime, but my brother right. gets like extra extra crispy. Like he's dark, way darker than me. <laughs> But his twin sister, you wouldn't think she's Puerto Rican at all. Like she's just, you know, she looks like a white person, and they're they're twins. And it's because they got uh, different. They, they, their DNA traits have been are different. You know, they're they're twins, but right. they have are the parents got that passed on different DNA traits. And so I think sometimes that might be you know a very similar situation with these creatures. It may, might be dependent on the DNA that's inside them as to what they can do and what they, how they act around other people. We had Brian from episode 31 come on who says that, you know, he shot a Bigfoot. And in that episode, he says the red ones are violent. The black ones are fine, but the red ones tend to be more violent. And then we have um, Amy, who's a friend of mine, and she was on Sasquatch Chronicles. She went on there and talked about her experience of seeing this this creature, and she was so scared, it looked like it wanted to kill her. And I said to her, what color was it? And I had a feeling she was going to say red, and sure enough, it was red. And so it's like interesting things like that, that you start putting together. And that's where I said earlier, I really enjoy the topic now because before it was just this childlike fascination. Now I'm like putting puzzle pieces together to get a picture. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I hear sometimes they're like, depending where in the country they are, they could have different dispositions, right? Oh, absolutely. Like different the- body sizes, everything. Wow. I mean, like if you look at the, the Pacific Northwest, the cougars up in the Pacific Northwest, the mountain lions, they can get up to like 200 pounds. And they're huge, absolutely huge. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania still doesn't want to acknowledge that cougars are actually in Pennsylvania. They, they, they won't acknowledge that they're a mountain lion, yet we have many people who say they've seen them. But these mountain lion, they'll get to be like 90, 100 pounds, a buck 10. I mean, right. they're not, they're like half the size of the ones on the West Coast. I mean, that's yeah, just like babies. Regional. Yeah, and they're the same animal, just they grow bigger in the Pacific Northwest. Well, well, it's different food sources, different everything. Yep. Like you say, there's also the genetic thing. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. And what do I know? I'm just a trucker anyway, so. (laughs) (laughs) I just just spend time thinking about this stuff. But um, I'll tell you what, Carl, man, I appreciate appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing these experiences. I think it was a good conversation. Yeah, man, definitely. No problem. I enjoyed it. This is not a test. This is your emergency broadcast system announcing the commencement of the annual purge sanctioned by the U.S. government. Commencing at the siren, any and all crime, including murder, will be legal for 12 continuous hours. Police, fire, and emergency medical services will be unavailable until tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. when the purge concludes. And for the first time since its inception, No one has been granted special immunity from the purge. No citizen or group will be exempt. Blessed be our new founding fathers and America, a nation reborn. May God be with you all. All right, let's take a break right now. Before we get to Emma, I want to talk to you about this week's sponsor, which is a returning sponsor, a sponsor I strongly believe in, which is Simply Safe. Here's the thing about home security companies. Most trap you with high prices, tricky contracts, and lousy customer service. So while there are a lot of options out there, there's only one no-brainer, and that's Simply Safe. Listen, my dad used to do home security systems before he was a truck driver. If you listen to the other show, Hammer Lane Legends, we talk about a lot of truck driving on that show. But before he was a truck driver, he was a home security installer. And my dad tells me all the horror stories of having to install that stuff as an installer. Simply Safe is not like that. 
you as the consumer can install it yourself. It takes like less than an hour, maybe an hour max, depending on how big your house is. I mean, some of you guys might live in mansions and so it might take more than an hour. I don't know. But all it is is you take these sensors and you just peel the back off and you stick them wherever you need them in the house, in the windows, the doors. There's a lot of options, including cameras. In fact, me and my wife are talking about getting some more cameras on our house because yes, we do use Simply Safe. We even have that pretty sign in the front yard saying that we're you know, simply safe protected. But we do use Simply Safe and we're thinking about getting some more cameras, especially for one on the front of the house. So it actually shows us who's on the front porch because when I'm in the studio or my wife's in the basement and we hear somebody knocking on the door, it'd be nice to know before you go upstairs to answer the door who's there. So Simply Safe has all the stuff that any security system provider would offer. But the great thing about Simply Safe is it just starts at $15 a month. Hook it up to dispatch and they'll respond with police, firefighters, EMTs, any kind of emergency you have, they can respond. It's a great option for people who are living on budgets but don't want to sacrifice the security of their homes. And listen, I'm not the only one. They're not the only ones saying this. Simply Safe is great. US News and World Report named it the best overall home security of 2020. Listen, security is at a premium right now. We need to make sure we keep our home safe because there's a lot of craziness in the world. I talk about it a lot on the show, but I have never seen the world this crazy. And so security on your home is definitely a must in my opinion. So Try Simply Safe today at simplysafe.com slash confessionals. You get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. There's nothing to lose. That's simplysafe.com slash confessionals. Check it out right now. Okay, today we have Emma coming on the show. Emma, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Tony. How are you? I'm doing fine. So I just want to let everybody know how much of a trooper you are because (laughs) you're in Australia and I didn't realize that when we scheduled this, but uh, it's six o'clock in the morning your time and we're doing this interview. So I really do appreciate you waking up early to do this. Oh, anytime. (laughs) So you've had uh, some different experiences throughout your life and uh, Mm -hmm. let's just start off with the the shadow man that you were seeing and uh, walk us into, you know, when you first started seeing it and how this all unfolded for you. Yeah, sure thing. Um, So the shadow man was a little bit later when I became a teenager. Um, But the first thing that I I kind of was seeing was when I was still small enough to be sleeping with a bedside light on. And I remember this one night, my wardrobe doors were open and I could see these shadowy foxes like running out of my wardrobe, out of my room and out into our kids' rumpus room. Um, and I just remember that terrified me so much. And I remember another night that it happened, I was crying so much that my brother came out and he was like, Emma, be quiet. Um, but I mean, that was that, like, I, I didn't get comforted at all or anything like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was seeing those for maybe only about a year or so. Um, and then like that kind of got my fear into never sleeping with a wardrobe open, which a lot of people probably have. Um, But the next thing that kind of happened was when we were renting, uh, so so we moved, we were living in the Blue Mountains, and we then moved um, down further down the coast of New South Wales, and we were renting a house and building a house five houses down, so it was all in the same street, so it was nice and close. Um, And I had a friend coming over, and she was sleeping on the floor in my room, just on a mattress, and I had a single bed, so I was still pretty small. Um, And there were these like black cats everywhere, like everywhere. And they were crawling on her and on my bed. Um, And I got so scared that she ended up having to come and hop into my single bunk bed there, um, or single bed. And that was really all that happened in that room and in that rental house. I didn't have anything else strange happen there. Um, And then the, the scariest thing for me was when we moved into our new house. So I had, uh, I had my room there, nothing happened there until I moved into my bigger brother's old room. So he had moved out. Um, and so in that room, I was in early, early teens, maybe 14 or 15. Um, and I began to see the shadow man in my room and he would stand in the corner of my room right next to my door and he wouldn't do anything other than stand there. So it's, It's not like he came over to the bed or anything, but he was just such a big looming figure. And our ceilings, they were like the standard um, height over here, 2.5 metres, I think. Um, But he was just smaller than than the roof. 
Um, and I can like remember the feeling that I got in my body when, when he would be there. Uh, it's like it was, it's like getting an electric shock, but the shock doesn't stop. Like it's just that constant, almost burning feeling. Um, and like my breathing was so heavy and I felt like even if I wanted to, to kind of roll away, cause I'm, I'm a side sleeper or a tummy sleeper, even if I wanted to kind of roll away, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to move my body. Um, yeah. And, oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it like, it's, it sounds silly, but if I, I thought if I just didn't move, I just stayed there. Like it, it wouldn't see me. Um, and like, all I could do really is just pray and just try and keep myself so still. Um, and then, so I, I was seeing that for a couple of years and then I started to see this white mist above my bed. Uh, so that terrified me even more because now I had something like right next to my only way out of my room and something also directly above me while I'm laying in my bed. Uh, so in, in around 2013, I moved up to my grandparents' place in Sydney just during the week so I could attend uni. Uh, and I only had two strange things happen there. And the first was when I walked out of my room uh, on the left side of my bedroom door there there was this woman in what I can only describe as colonial clothes, like like a long dress with like an apron on, on top and a little bonnet with her hair in a low bun, sorry, a bonnet and her hair was in a bun. Um, but once I turned back around, she was gone and um, my grandpa built the house. So it's not like there was any weird things that happened in the house because it was like my mom's family home. Um, and then the other thing that happened was my grandma and I used to watch these like crazy survival shows, like I shouldn't be alive. Um, and they would go around to like 11 30, 12 o'clock at night. And so we had decided to, to go to bed and we had turned off all the lights. We were walking past the kitchen and up the hallway and the pot on the stove fell off. Like I can understand that maybe it was a bit close to the edge. Um, but then the TV also turned on, like turned back on. So the, it was kind of just a weird kind of coincidence that they both happened at the same time. Um, and then, so I, I'd also gone to Europe on a study trip during that same year that I was living in Sydney. And I had a dream one night that, um, that my grandpa was there. So my grandpa, he passed away when I was five and he was born with hip dysplasia. And I kind of feel a little bit of a connection with him because I was also born with hip dysplasia. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I like to think that I kind of have that bond with him. Uh, and in my dream, I saw my grandpa and I was so excited because I could see him and talk to him again. And, I mean, I, I have very limited memories of when I was five years old of him. So I was, just, yeah, so happy in that dream. Um, and I, But I eventually lost him in the dream and I was asking everyone in this courtyard if they had seen him. And I eventually found him. It was kind of like um, like an like a room, except it was outdoors, and three of the sides were bricked in, and the the main wall there was open, and the room was totally dark. But he was standing in there, and so I went over to him. I was like, "I'm so happy that you're here. Like, I thought I wouldn't be able to say goodbye." And he just said to me, "You don't need to worry anymore. I'm always going to be looking out for you." And then he turned into that mist, and so then I kind of put it together that every time that I was seeing the shadow man, that miss would be above my bed and it was actually my grandpa, I guess, protecting me against that. So that was really comforting. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, I haven't had anything in years now, thankfully. Um, but I mean, still, if I go back down to my room, down at my parents' place, I still get like a really kind of uneasy feeling. Um, I don't like to, to think about it because I, I do feel like the more effort and thought you put into them, the more kind of power and energy it gives. Um, so as long as I don't think about it, I'm okay. But, I mean, even now, uh, like sometimes in my room here, I try not to think about it because I don't want to give any energy or anything like that to it. And, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, that, yeah, that's basically my experience with those kind of entities and 
I, I didn't even know that they were, I guess, real. I thought that I'd actually made it up in my head up until uh, there was a podcast, uh, an episode, sorry, that Astonishing Legends put out about the shadow people. And I remember I just left that in my downloads for a week because I was like, there is no way I'm listening to that. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I got the courage and I was like, I cannot believe that these things, like, actually exist. Like. Yeah. <laughs> so up to that point, did you think that, you know, you were just imagining things? Yeah, like I thought that it was just in my head and I'd, like, I, I remember telling my mom, she's like, oh, you're probably just seeing things, you know, it's it's dark at night. But, like, this thing is, like, it's it's pitch black, like, you can't miss it. It's so huge. Um, the hat, like, the, and it's so it's so typical of the Shadow Man, but, like, like this is what I was seeing. In, in the corner of my room uh, and yeah I, like it, it was comforting to know that other people had seen it as well but also absolutely terrifying because it meant that these things actually are real. So in the moment of seeing these shadow figures were you in a state of fear? I mean was this something that was absolutely terrifying to you? Yeah I, I was I was petrified um, and it would last for an hour two hours and I like my skin just felt so hot and painful and my heartbeat was so fast. And yeah, like I, I just didn't want to move because I, I didn't want it to know that I was there, which it sounds stupid because it's in my room. Like it knows that I'm there, but yeah, I just wanted to be as small as possible, cover myself with blankets and yeah. Yeah. That's understandable. And Mm. you know, it lasting an hour or two is that's a long time. I mean, I think a lot of times people will see these things and it's, you know, a minute, two minutes or less. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that long for it to actually be there. And I'm assuming it just stood there. Didn't, it didn't do anything other than just stand there. Yeah. Yeah. So it would, it would just be in the corner. It wouldn't move. It like didn't come over to the bed, but I just felt like it was just such an oppressive feeling. And yeah, like it was, it was just petrifying. I mean, I don't know how else to, to, to explain it. No, I, I totally understand. I mean, I, I'd be scared too, especially it, it sounds almost like torturous to have to suffer through an hour to two hours of this thing standing there, just watching Mm. you. Uh, and then at the time, not knowing what the white mist was above you, that had to be scary too. Yeah, so that like, I mean, it was almost, uh, and I had a dog that slept uh, on the floor in my room as well. Um, but just to have both of those things in there, and she was on the floor, and she, she almost felt so far away, and I like, just couldn't cuddle her, but I couldn't move either. Like, I couldn't turn the light on. I mean, which would have made everything better, I feel. Um, but to have that dream and to realize that actually that was my grandpa above me protecting me. Like if I had known that at the time, I think I would have dealt with it a lot better. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I mean, I'm so glad that nothing has happened since cause it's, yeah, it's literally a nightmare. Oh, I'm sure. Have you talked to people other than your mom about this though? No, not really. Um, just because I, I don't think that people would believe it. Um, I don't know anyone that has seen anything like that. Um, I mean, I have friends that, that, you know, they feel like they've been poked while they've been sleeping. Um, but yeah, I don't know anyone that has actually seen anything in their room or, or, or a spirit or a ghost or anything like that. You know, I think sometimes people think that they're alone in these situations, so they don't talk about it. But I think a Mm -hmm. lot of times people you know, I, I think there's a lot of times where many people are experiencing different things, but they all stay quiet because they think they're the only one. And in reality, there's a lot of other people around you that probably experience stuff too. Uh, I can mm. understand the reservation with that and stuff. I'm I'm a different kind of guy. I mean, if I see something, I talk about it. I don't really care. Uh, so, you know, I don't really worry about that kind of stuff, but I can understand the, the hesitations with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I would feel very comfortable knowing that the white mist was, um, you know, your grandfather. I mean, it's, it's something mm. that definitely would give comfort. Mm. Uh, and I, I do remember I, I told my mom that 
dream when I got home and she was like, like, that's really special. You should tell your dad. And I did. And I, I think that was like, oh, yeah. But um, but for me, like, that's always just going to be something that that is just so special. And sometimes when I feel scared or, or when I was feeling scared, I was, you know, just kind of mentally talking to him like, far, like, if you're still there, like, I could really just use some comfort at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, between that and praying and lying incredibly still, that was kind of my my way to get by. Well, it sounds like you got by okay. I mean, mm. <laughs> so uh, other than a few scares and stuff. Now, uh, <clears throat> you had mentioned to me earlier that, you know, you, I guess you grew up in a family that went to church and things like that. Mm. And uh, before we get into this, the one topic I, I wanted to bring up to you, uh, did the idea of, you know, your grandfather protecting you at night, did that contradict anything for you in, with your beliefs or anything? Or uh, is it something that is just so real to you? It's just like, you know, what, you, what your thoughts were beforehand don't really matter because of how real it was for you after that happened. No, so I mean, I was, I, it didn't affect anything about um, my belief in God because um, I, I believe in angels and spirits and things like that. And I think that God was just, you know, sending my grandpa just, just a, a little bit of support and comfort. Um, I definitely think that God, because I always used to say, please just bless his house. Um, and I really do think that he protected me during that as well. Um, but I think he was just sending my grandpa down there as well, just as a bit of a bit of comfort and yeah. Yeah, and mm. I I think so too. I mean, uh, I I grew up in a in a in a household where you know we I was taught one thing, and as you get older, you start thinking about things, and you you formulate your own thoughts and opinions on things. And I I definitely think that there's um, I I don't understand how it works, but I definitely think that there are times where people experience spirits of you know, dead people here that were once here on earth. Uh, I don't, like I said, I don't understand how it works. You know, I don't think anybody really does, you know, it's just mm-hmm. one of those things where everybody has their theories and stuff. But, uh, I definitely, I definitely understand where you're coming from. Now you mentioned to me earlier, I think it was initially through an email that, you know, you'd never heard of, uh, Enoch before. I, was it before my show? Yeah, that's right. So, I was like, Enoch? Who's Enoch? I full on got out my Bible. I was like, I don't recall being an Enoch in the Bible. Couldn't find it anywhere. So I was like, what's what's the go with this Enoch guy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, so he, he's not talked about a whole lot. And I, I know that, um, you know, it's not necessarily the the talking point to talk, to preach on when you go to church and stuff, because uh, he, he is in the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, you know, he I think he was... If I remember correctly, he was Noah's grandfather's father, or something like that. Uh, he he was he was really up there though in the lineage. I mean, the guy uh, he he was back when you know people lived hundreds of years. <laughs> so uh, he had great, great genes and and DNA. But um, yeah, it basically he I believe personally there there's three books of Enoch, and I think the very first book. Uh, Enoch himself actually wrote uh, the other two. I, I don't really subscribe to him being the true author of that. Uh, but the very first one, I do believe that he wrote, and uh, and you've heard me talk about. It, I'm sure on the show, but uh, you know he wrote about these bizarre things happening in the world, and he wrote about it in like current event form. So like he was writing down what he was experiencing, and. I find it very fascinating because uh, when you look at the Genesis 6 story, uh, particularly verse 4, the author of Genesis, uh, Moses, uh, he doesn't go into great detail about this whole idea of the fallen angels and, you know, copulating with uh, human beings and then uh, the offspring being these this gigantic breed of hybrid humans. Uh, mm. Moses doesn't go into great detail. And I think that's because in the time that Moses was writing Genesis, I think that they already had the book of Enoch and everybody knew the story of Enoch. They knew what was going on and how it happened. And so when he's writing the book of Genesis, I don't think he was writing the book of Genesis for an audience 2000 years later. And mm. so... I think he left out certain details because 
it, it was pointless to write down details to an audience that already knew the history. You know, uh, I don't think like, I mean, you're not going to break down, you know, things that we know today in detail just to tell people that already know the information. It, it's it's just kind of pointless. And I think yeah. that's why it's not a whole lot in the Bible. But I would tell you that in the New Testament, well, it's actually throughout the Bible, but there's been several cases throughout the Bible and particularly the New Testament where the where like Paul actually quoted from the book of Enoch. And I think um, uh, James did as well. Uh, so it, it's a very interesting thing because when you look at the book of Enoch and you read through it, you'll you'll start seeing things. You're like, wait a second, I've heard that before. And then you find it in the Bible and it's like, oh, snap. These people <laughs> that were writing the Bible quoted things from this book of Enoch. And so it, it tells you that they actually gave weight to uh, what was written there. Uh, I, yeah. I, I find it very fascinating. Why it's not in the Bible, I don't know. Um, I if it was up to me, it would be in the Bible, but it's not up to me, so it's not. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kind of got to trust that you know people made the right decisions with why they decided to leave it out, I guess. But I definitely think it's something that can be used for historical uh, purposes and understanding history, uh, and and you know using it as a reference guide. I have a a copy of the Book of Enoch sitting on my desk at all times, so mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting, though. Yeah, I might have to get my hands on a copy, I think, because, I mean, from what I've heard from the podcast, it's definitely piqued my interest. And, I mean, my next question was, so why is it not in the Bible? But, I mean, you've just answered that one. So, yeah, Yeah. I might have to go out and get my hands on a copy. Yeah, there's there's a lot of books that aren't in the Bible. uh, And there's a lot of books that were once in the Bible and they were taken out of the Bible. And those are issues that people who, you know, who want to struggle with it, they do. They struggle with it because some people are, are very happy to just say, well, if it's not in the Bible. It's not supposed to be there. And then there's other people who are like, well, it was in the Bible at one time and we chose to take it out. Why? I think Enoch mm-hmm. was actually in the Bible, but I, there's there's like several, several books that were taken out and um, it, it's left up to debate as to if that was a good idea or not. Um, but at one time, you know, People thought it, thought it well enough to have these certain books in the Bible, and now they're not there. And so, uh, but I, I would say that if you wanted to get your hands on a, a book, the book of Enoch, I think there's a publishing company called Defender Publishing, D-E-F-E-N-D-E-R, Defender mm-hmm. Publishing. And I think that they they sell um, lots of different books and stuff. And I think that's where I got my book of Enoch. Uh, but yeah. Great stuff, Emma. I think that uh, it's very interesting that you had those experiences with um, the shadow man and then the, the, the fact that you feel that your grandfather was protecting you. And that's kind of been confirmed through this dream where you, you had your grandfather mm-hmm. go into this white mist that you actually did see during these experiences. I, I can imagine how that would be comforting. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, 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 I went from being, you know, terrified to being like, it's okay because he can't touch me. He can't touch me here, you know? I mean, my grandpa's right there and he's protecting this whole bed. He's protecting the room. He can't touch me here, so. Yeah, and I don't know. I think about these things and, you know, you hear about people going through a haunting experience where they were scratched in their back and things like that. But outside of that, I don't really ever recall a whole lot of people dying from experiencing some kind of paranormal haunting. And so mm. I guess that's kind of why I just go into these situations like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> like I'm like, I, I don't remember somebody dying from a ghost. So I, I'll survive. And so yeah. <laughs> I don't worry about it a whole lot. But um, yeah, it's really cool. And I appreciate coming on the show and sharing. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.